Hey, welcome to the uh, to the Garrigus building, and uh, we are. It seems odd, uh, or for me, it seems like just a couple weeks ago we were putting hams in cure. In January, there was about six inches of snow on the ground. It was cold, and now we're looking at uh, we're looking down the barrel of June and almost ready to conclude this. Which is a couple more months until the state fair. Uh, as you can see, we are recording this, and anybody that wants these slides, shoot me an email. We'll be more than happy to, to send these to you. We hope to have this uh, up on the, uh, you go straight to the UK YouTube page, right, Kevin? Yeah. Yeah. Probably have that up later on this uh, next week or so. But um, we'll go ahead and get started with the speech workshop. Every year we have uh, speech topics, and... These are designed to further your knowledge into the whole country ham experience. And the junior topics are usually topics or, or questions that I get throughout the year. Uh, and so I thought, well, we'll just do those as junior topics. And the seniors, I kind of challenge you guys a little bit more. Uh, I want you to think a little bit more, kind of get you prepared for college and high school and things like that. So. Juniors, your topic this year is how to store and cook a country ham. And seniors, yours is to design a country ham curing facility for your county's project. So we're going we're gonna to go over the uh, first topic. We're going to go over the junior topic, and then we'll delve into the senior topic. This is just to be a kind of a, uh, a put some knowledge bullets in your gun, so to speak. I don't want you to think you have to repeat what I say up here. This is just something to kind of an educational thing, give you a background so you know where to go with it. And so, like I said earlier, our junior topic is usually questions that I get or some of the other agents or volunteers get, especially after the state fair. And uh, this is a common question. Now, even though we've had this speech topic this year, I guarantee you there'll be a dozen people at the end of the state fair, that open day state fair when we have our project, uh, there'll be about a dozen people come up to me and say, okay, now what do I do with this thing? And which isn't too bad because if you look at our current numbers, I'm getting ready to ship those, that list out to the uh, counties for double checking or triple checking actually. We're about 784 acres in the project this year with 62 counties. So we, we're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But everybody asks me, you know, or like I said, I have about a dozen people after the State Fair ask me, what do I do with this ham? How do I store it? How do I cook it? And that's the whole premise of that. Yeah, come on in, come on in. <laughs> come on in. We just got started. Just got started. So We used to have this workshop in the early, early spring to late winter. When school was still in session, it was hard to find parking. So now we've moved it to when school's out, so there's no school going on. But uh, like I said earlier, question we normally get is, what do I do with this ham after state fair? How do I cook it and so on and so forth? How do I store it, all right? So when we're talking about storing a country ham, let's examine what's going on here, all right? Let me ask you this. It's kind of a class participation part. Every one of us in this room has grown up with the ability to go into the kitchen, open up a door in a giant metal box, and when you open up that door, that giant metal box known as a refrigerator, it's cold inside there, all right? How long have we had a thing called the refrigerator or mechanical refrigeration? How long have we had that? Yeah, it's, it's been about 60 or 80 years since we've had it. We haven't had it for a long period of time. Got some more folks. Come on in. Come on in. So we've been on this earth for quite some time, right? So how do we keep food from spoiling before mechanical refrigeration? Well, this is what the country ham is, is we, we use salt to preserve the ham or preserve other foods. And so basically what we're looking at is a throwback to the way hams were cured or even food was cured before mechanical refrigeration. And so if you look at this, there's a reason why we started in January. We let Mother Nature be Mother Nature, all right? It was cold. 
So we let Mother Nature be the refrigerator. And so while we put that cure on there that's mainly salt, sugar, other spices, okay, the Mother Nature kept the ham cold so that they allowed the salt and sugar to penetrate the ham. So come on in, come on in. See, this is the beauty of being a college professor. I'm used to lecturing while people are walking in and out, so it doesn't bother me all that much. So, and these folks get to sit right up here in the amen section too, so. so the folks that got here earlier in the back, the folks that got late have to sit up front, so that's the way it works. Um, so we let Mother Nature be the refrigerator while the salt and sugar penetrated the ham. It takes roughly, you know, about two pounds or two days per pound of ham for that salt and sugar to penetrate. By the time springtime rolled around, you got to realize we're not dealing with a normal temperature cycle this year. You know, spring happened like two weeks ago for, for us. You know, it seemed like winter just wouldn't, wouldn't let go. But uh, normally spring's going to roll around sometime in March, middle of March, uh, and ham starts to warm up. Okay, and the temperature outside warms up. And this is when that ham is fully cured. And now we're going to age it. We're going to start to develop that characteristic flavor and aroma of a country ham. Okay. And so if you look at what's happening here, and if you go back to your own counties and you look at what's happening, those ham barns in your own county, they're pretty much the same temperature it is as it is outside. So they they haven't seen anything colder than 50 degrees in the last couple months, right? So let's answer this question, because I always get this, okay? Even though this ham for the last six months is, has set outside and warm temperatures above 50 degrees, it's set at the state fair for 36 hours, and it's not refrigerated there on those tables in Cloverville, and everybody comes up to me, I shouldn't say everybody, a lot of people come up to me and said, do I need to put this in the refrigerator? Okay, let's answer that question. Do you need to take your ham home from the, to, from the state fair and put it in the refrigerator? No, no, it's, it's like we said, this is learning about the heritage, all right? Learning about how food was preserved before before mechanical refrigeration. But that doesn't mean that we can store this ham anywhere, all right? And this becomes a bit of a challenge. There's some places that are okay to store ham. There's other places that are not. For example, you look at that picture up there. That's a picture of a basement, right? Okay. Basements are a good place to store hams, but you gotta realize basements tend to be moist, and so, what's going to grow on that ham that likes moisture? Mold. Now, is mold on a country ham a bad thing? No, no, it's not. But it freaks people out, all right? I always tell the story of a few years ago. It seems like just a few years ago. It's probably about six or seven years ago. A family called me up, and they said, we don't know what to do. We, we, we have friends in Michigan. We have family and friends in Michigan. And so we took our country ham, our extra country ham, and we thought it'd be, be fun. You know, the kids made this. We're going to ship it off to Michigan for them to, uh, to enjoy. Well, the ham got up to Michigan. It was covered in mold, and the people up there threw it away. Okay, so It's no big deal. Ham's a pretty common thing on those. So if you're going to store your ham in the basement, make sure or understand that it's going to grow mold. Now you can also, you know, like in my basement, my basement gets wet, it's a finished basement, but we've got a dehumidifier down there. So if you don't want to scrub the mold off the ham, you can always go to Walmart or Kmart or Myers or wherever and buy a dehumidifier to kind of control that. Mold typically doesn't like to grow at, at, at humidity less than 60%, okay? But if you have cats, dogs, things like that in the house that wander through the basement or through the yard or whatever, need to store it in a place where it keeps it away from the dogs and the cats and the pests and things like that. Let's look at some other areas. What do you think of that? That is nice. That looks like a guy that rides a motorcycle that makes his wife mad a lot. 
I mean, he's got a he's got a big screen TV in there, a bar. Yeah, he doesn't have a good marriage. His wife's throwing him out all the time in the garage. But but uh, what's the problem with that area? What do you think? Yeah, it's open. That's a big door, isn't it? Yeah. So if it's open to the environment and he sits out there and watches the NASCAR race all the time, what's going to come in that garage? Well, flies, bugs, things like that. And if you got your ham in there, you're going to get some flies and bugs on there. What about this one? I don't know about you, but these people are weird. Who parks a car in a garage? That's just weird, right? That's just odd. You know, I can't imagine why somebody would do that in this day and age. But if you are one of those people that parks your car in your garage and you got your ham in your garage, number one, like we talked about earlier, you got this big open space so anything and everything can walk in and out. What else is a problem of parking your car and we got, look, we got three motorcycles there? The exhaust, right? So every time they start that car or they start those motorcycles in that garage, those hams are going to absorb that car exhaust. All right? Now that doesn't mean it makes it fit for, unfit for consumption. It's just going to be kind of nasty smelling. All right? It may taste funny as well. Kind of the same thing with this, or excuse me, what's wrong with this one here? Yeah, it's very open, right? Do you think that ham's going to absorb uh, that tobacco aroma? Yeah. This might be how we get people to eat more ham, as we <laughs> store them inside tobacco barns and they get addicted from the nicotine that gets absorbed. I don't know if the nicotine gets absorbed into ham, but it makes for a pretty good story nonetheless. But yeah, you can see, open area, susceptible to pests, birds, things like that. Um, I've actually had experience with this. When I was in grad school at Missouri, I was judging a country ham show in Cuba, Missouri. Yes, there is a Cuba, Missouri. It's about 60 miles southwest of St. Louis. And I picked up a ham and it smelled just like diesel fuel. Now Missouri's 4-H project is different. Okay, where you get together as a county or a group of counties get together to put hams in cure. At, in Missouri, each kid is responsible for his own ham. So you have to go out and buy the hams and then do the cure yourself and everything else. And so this particular 4-H'er, he had his ham in the barn, the machine shed. And high ceilings, high rafters, and so he would he would actually uh, hang the, the ham from the rafters and it was easy for him to climb up on the tractor to check the ham. So as you can imagine, every time dad or grandpa started that big diesel tractor, and if you've ever been around diesel tractors, as soon as you start them, that stack right there kicks out pitch black smoke. And it was just bathing this ham. And it smelled just like diesel fuel, okay? And I'm sure it probably tasted like diesel fuel as well. And again, it's going to pick up those odors. It's a big open area. You know, especially we got that dirt floor. The others had concrete floors. Dirt floors, we got now mice and rats and rodents and things like that can burrow in there. So probably not a good idea to keep your ham and if you're one of those people that keeps your, your cars in your garage or you got a machine shed, it's probably not a good idea to keep your hams there. If you don't keep your car, in the garage, all right, and you control how often that door, that garage door goes up and down, it might be a good idea to keep your ham in the garage. It just depends on what, what happens there. All right, corn cribs, kind of same thing as tobacco barn, right? Pretty open areas. They're pretty susceptible to pests. Now, a lot of folks ask me, okay, uh, don't have a basement, we're one of those weird people. We park our cars in the garage. What about a closet? Can we store our ham in a closet in the house? Okay. What do you think? Yeah, that would work, right? Putting your ham in the closet in the house. Okay. And the two things to think about. All right. Number one, 
that ham's going to continue to lose moisture. So you're going to have to put something under the ham to catch the drippings. The other thing is if you got clothes in that closet, guess what's going to happen? Your clothes are going to smell like ham, right? So ladies, you remember that old Taco Bell commercial where the, the, the two gals are out on the, on the, in the nightclub and one's dabbing perfume to attract the guys and the other, the other gal brings out one of those bacon chalupa things and all the guys start running up. So it may be a way of attracting guys. I don't know. If you smell like ham, it, it could work. It could work. But just realize, you know, that's what happens. You know. So ideally, you would just build your own ham house and just leave it there. You know, but we don't always have those luxuries. So just some things to think about as you start to develop your speech, all right? The other way we, we uh, often run into you know, people asking is, how do we cook these things, all right? I've got this big 13-pound ham, all right? I don't have a meat bandsaw. Um, that's a lot for a family of four to eat is a big 13-pound ham, so what do I do? What do I do? Well, we have discovered that some counties uh, have a, some some private grocery stores that are willing to slice 4-H country hams, all right? Others, maybe not, but that's something that the volunteers and the 4-H leaders and the uh, agents can work out, all right, to maybe one of the local grocery stores to slice your ham. All right? And if you do slice your ham, okay, frying is probably your best option of cooking a sliced country ham. Now, when you start to work with your local grocery store or even local meat processor on slicing these country hams, we've got to get these things thin, less than a quarter of an inch, ideally around an eighth of an inch is how thick we want them. Why? We've essentially made a big 13, 14 pound piece of jerky. And so we need to slice it thin so you can chew through it, all right? And plus, if it's sliced thin, the more of flavor is going to come out as well. All right, so we got to make sure we slice them thin. Now, sliced fried country ham is going to have a very different flavor profile than the baked country hams we're going to talk about here in a second. They're going to be very different, uh, different flavors, all right? Now, if you're a little apprehensive about the salt level of hams, you can run those slices under some cold water to help remove some of the salt. Does, doesn't take a lot of salt out of there, but I've heard of a lot of people doing that, is running them under cold water, soaking them for an hour or so in, in water, try to remove some of that, that salt as well. But if you do fry your country ham and you do it inside the kitchen, all right, I'm a big fan and I run around for a lot of chefs and they tell me the same thing. The best thing you can cook country ham on is cast iron. You got an old or a new or whatever type of cast iron skillet, that's the best thing to cook country ham on in the kitchen. The other issue we have with it, and I've heard this from ham curers throughout the country, is the biggest problem they have is customers overcooking ham. Country ham doesn't need much, just about 45 seconds to a minute per side. That's all you need to fry a country ham. So basically, if you're going to have dinner at 7 o'clock, you start frying your country ham at 6.58, okay? Minute per side and you're done. If you really want to have some fun, you got a gas grill. You can do it with a charcoal grill, but it just seems odd to go through all that rigmarole of a charcoal grill just to fry something for two minutes. you got to love construction. <laughs> sounds of construction. Um, but if you got a gas grill, grill your country ham. Same thing, about a minute per side, totally different flavor profile. Just something fun. And you know I'm telling the truth because I'm a fat guy up here telling you, you can't take cooking advice from a skinny person. Okay? Doesn't, doesn't count, right? So that's frying. Now, others uh, that are, like I said earlier, Others that are into frying country ham, they like to have things sliced thin. And you can see, here's a traditional way up here in the, uh, the corner right here. 
This is a meat band saw. Like I said, have your, your processor or your grocery store slice these. If they can get them less than a quarter of an inch, it's ideal. You can kind of see the diagram of how the, uh, the, uh, the bone, the femur bone sits in there. We always slice at an angle. So we're slicing, you know, that femur bone. When we get done, we should have a nice round femur bone. Others prefer the European method. And you can see this gentleman down here. Basically, a, he's created a wooden box. Hopefully this is a wooden box that's dedicated to hams and not something that he chews horses on or something like that. So it's got, remember, we're, we're, we're still serving food. Europeans tend to utilize this method where they got the ham in a, in a slicing box and they slice razor thin slices. Now they eat their ham uncooked, which you can do that as well, but they do razor thin slices and they're going with the grain. That's the European method. We got a lot of do-it-yourselfers out there who will get a hand meat saw and they will knock this end off and then they'll knock the back end off and they'll go in there and remove the bone and they probably got the meat saw at maybe Bass Pro Shops or Cabela's or bought one online and they might go out and they buy one of their own hand slicers you can do that as well it's just how much time you want to invest in it all right so a lot of ways of slicing country ham okay others this is more of a western kentucky tradition i've come across is usually southwestern kentucky and tennessee these are the traditions of, of that area is boiled country ham uh, again we're going to clean the ham and soak it overnight all right this is going to help remove some of that water like we were talking about with the slices where we soak that in water for for an hour or so to help remove that some of that salt this is the same thing if you're going to soak them overnight, the best way to do this, if you have a cooler that has a little drain plug, put the ham in there, fill the cooler up with water, come back 12 hours later, pull the drain plug, let the water come out, reclose the drain plug, fill it up with water again, changing the water. Okay, That's what you're doing is you're changing the water. You're soaking those hams overnight. That's going to help pull some of that uh, uh, some of that salt out of there. Now. What I've heard a lot of people do is the big, if you're one of those individuals at Thanksgiving that fries their turkeys, you got any tur people that fry turkeys for Thanksgiving? A few of you. Okay, if you still have that and you haven't burnt down your house by frying a turkey, okay, we always go through fried turkey safety at Thanksgiving, okay? For example, make sure it's, your turkey's dry when you drop it in there, okay? And when I say drop, don't mean drop, lower it in there, okay? All right, so, uh, but if you have that big container there, this works perfect for it. Fill it with water, add a cup of molasses or sugar, quarter cup of cider, uh, cider vinegar, bring the whole thing to a boil, reduce the heat, and simmer it until the internal temperature reaches 170 degrees. I've also heard of people bringing it to a boil, taking it off the heat and wrapping it in quilts and comforters for the next 12 hours. Basically what they're doing is trying to keep the heat inside there. All right. So there's variations on how to do this. All right. As soon as the internal temperature reaches about 165, 170, remove the ham from the, from the liquid, let it cool, remove the skin, and then you can glaze and bake it at 400 degrees until the glaze is a golden brown, okay? So, just little things you can do. Yes, ma'am. So I have a question, and I've made a couple of hands, and I'm always worried about that internal temperature, and some things I've, I've, I've read lots of things, and yep. they said at 145, 160, 170. So does it really, I mean... Doesn't matter. Because you said we could eat it uncooked, which I didn't know you could oh, yeah. not cook. So it really... In the, in the 15 years of doing this, yeah, in the 15 years of doing this, I've eaten more uncooked country ham than I have cooked. And that third arm I have comes in handy, so, you know. So, yeah, internal temperature, especially on a big whole muscle cut, is not that big of a deal. Okay. So, so you're good, whatever you wanted to cook it to. How do you clean it? Um, if you're cleaning it to cook, I would just get you... A hose and a scrub brush, and, and when I say scrub brush, please, folks, we're still 
making food here, don't go to the bathroom and get the scrub brush for the toilet. All right? And you're laughing, but I've heard that before. As Glenn Beck says, there's nothing common about common sense anymore. Or the other one is the scrub brush that you use to scrub the sink and the floor and everything else. Okay? A new scrub brush. Knock all that off and you're good to go. If you're getting it ready for the fair, what I usually tell folks is a about a 10% vinegar solution, same scrub brush, maybe a little toothbrush to get into the crevices. Does that make sense to you? Do you cut off the, do you cut off the, uh, anything on the outside? Nope. 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 Especially not for the state fair for a show ham, no. But for cooking, no, I wouldn't do that either. So. Even the mold? <laughs> yeah, you got to remove the mold. I mean, <laughs> I guess you can leave it on there, but I don't know why. <laughs> so. Yeah, I got to clean them. Got to clean them. So, good question. Anything else? No, just hurry up so we can go, get out of here, right? Now, here's another one. Kind of the same premise as the boiled ham, except for we're going to bake it. All right, so the boiled ham, we dropped it in boiled water and either let it simmer till it reached an internal temperature that we wanted, or we pull it off there and wrapped it in blankets to keep it warm. We're going to do the same thing clean the ham. Soak it overnight like we talked about, changing the water every 12 hours. And this is where those big foil, disposable foil pans that you always see a lot of at Thanksgiving, this is where that guy comes in handy again, all right? Preheat your oven to about 350, all right? Put the ham in the, uh, the uh, foil pan and then add liquid to the pan, all right? Now, there's a lot of different varieties or methods of doing this. You can use water. You can use, here we've got soda. I've heard of people using apple juice, apple cider. Apple flavors work well with pork. Um, others using cherry, like a cherry soda or a cherry flavored uh, uh, juice or something along those lines. Cherry flavors work good with cured meats. So it's whatever you want to add to it, all right? So you're gonna, you got your ham in there, you got your liquid in there, carefully without spilling it all over the kitchen, put it in the oven, cover it in foil, cook for 45 minutes, flip the ham, turn it over, <coughs> and then cook it till you get an internal temperature of around 160 degrees or so. And like we talked about earlier, uh, a lot of these internal temperatures are mainly to ensure that we're, getting, we're breaking down some of the connective tissue in there. That's the main reason. But from a safety standpoint, it's not a big deal. Okay? And let the ham cool and enjoy. Boiled hams and baked hams have a different texture and flavor than fried hams. If you are new to the country ham world and eating country hams, I usually steer you towards number one, a younger ham, which most of you in this room are producing older hams. By the time you get done with this project, your ham's going to be around nine months old. Okay, that's an older ham. It's going to have a more distinct flavor than a younger ham that's around three, three to four months old. Okay, or I steer them towards the boiled or the baked version of doing this. Okay, because it's a little less salty. It's going to be a little bit closer to the city ham. Does that make sense to folks? Yeah? Anybody hungry yet? No? <laughs> Can you tell the difference between boiled and baked? I haven't been able to. Yeah, I haven't been able to. Now, everybody's full of state pride, right? Kentuckians, we, we have a lot of pride. Not, you know, comes basketball, horses, our state pride. Now, in this area, when I, when I do this talk in western Kentucky, they give me blank looks like, what, what in the world is this thing you're talking about here? We want to keep a kind of a Kentucky kick to it. The liquid that you add, you could add AL8. All right? We've done this in the lab before. It's not too bad. It's not too bad. Okay? I go out west, nobody knows what an AL8 is. They have no idea what an AL8 is. Okay? And when I, when I started here at UK about eight years ago, I can remember I went to see the meat judging team off 
and the back of the van was full of cases of AL8. And he said, well, Dr. Intro, they don't sell AL8 anywhere else. So I guess we had a bunch of AL8 addicts there on that judging team about eight years ago. So you could add AL8 to it, works, works pretty well. Now here's something kind of fun, and you can get this, um, a lot of our uh, a lot of our country ham producers uh, throughout the state make red eye gravy, and red eye gravy's got a kind of a, a unique history. It goes back to the Civil War, and it goes back to a, uh, a, a, a Civil War general and his cook getting a little inebriated the night before, and were a little hungover the next day. And the cook asked the uh, the general what he wanted for breakfast and the general said I want country ham or at that time he just said ham okay the, the term country ham didn't appear in literature till the 40s but he said I want ham and I want a gravy as red as your eyes and so what the uh, what the young cook did was fried up the country ham and then deglazed the pan using black coffee and that's where the beginnings of country ham red eye gravy came from all right and so deglaze the ham with the black coffee add back the drippings i've seen people use hot sauce brown sugar worcestershire sauce whatever they want to add to the red eye gravy to give it a unique flavor okay and so red eye gravy is kind of a fun thing to make when you're done with your, with your country hams like i said serve over ham biscuits grips grits whatever questions that's some good questions. Does anybody want to take a quick five, ten minute break? Some of you are looking at me like, no, let's keep going. Yeah, firehouse subs is calling your name type thing. All right. All right, well, we'll keep on going then. Um, it is Saturday. Is anybody out of school yet outside of us? So if you ever out of school, okay. Okay, I didn't know if... Uh, there's some schools that are still in session.